everybody. Wow, we got folks from all over the world today. Welcome. And uh, thanks for joining us here at CBT Nuggets for a look at what's new in SQL Server 2016, which recently dropped uh, this early this summer. We've got a ton of great new features, many compelling reasons to upgrade. So in this webinar, we're just going to take a look at my top five favorite additions. And we'll also cover the, uh, the new certification track that came out, the MCSA on SQL Server 2016, and how Microsoft dramatically changed how MCSEs work. So we'll look at that. All right, hope you're all ready. Let's jump in. We'll start with uh, number five here, which just happens to be the query store. So here, here's the issue um, and, and kind of the, the, the problem that the query store solves. Troubleshooting performance. I know we've all been there. It's not easy, and it usually happens at the worst times, right? Those high-pressure situations, and you're trying to figure out what in the heck changed in my database that is causing all these issues. And uh, execution plans for queries evolve over time due to a number of different reasons, statistic changes, schema changes, index changes. And that query plan cache only stores the latest execution plan. So plans get evicted from the cache due to memory pressure or server restarts. And sure, we've got activity monitor, we've got DMVs, but those all get wiped out upon a restart. So query performance caused by plan regression is a huge time sink. It's a big deal, and it, uh, it's just a nightmare to deal with in real time. So the query store is this new feature that automatically captures and retains a history of all of our queries, all of our execution plans, runtime execution statistics, all of that vital information that we need to truly troubleshoot quickly. And it, it just simplifies the whole process. We can quickly find and identify the differences in our query plan changes and easily roll back or pin one down. So um, yeah, it's essentially a workload data recorder. And it's, it's just fantastic. And this alone is a, is, is a reason to upgrade because our performance issues usually take hours to fix, right? Now we're talking minutes. So this is a wonderful tool, and, uh, and, I, and I, I've already seen a lot of, of, uh, of good feedback from this tool. And uh, personally, I've used it quite a bit here just to identify, like, you know, what are my top 10 most expensive queries, and how did they get expensive, and how, what can I do to make them better? This tool can really go a long ways in helping us get there. So we can audit the history of query plans for a given query. We can analyze the resource usage patterns for a particular database, identify our top end queries, the list goes on. Fantastic tool. So that's number five. Number four, temporal tables. Another one of my personal favorites. Here's why. Um, if anybody's watched 70-463, I did that one quite a while ago. That was data warehousing with SQL Server 2012. And in that, we actually set up a slowly changing dimension to track all of our changes. Uh, so we have you know, the current snapshot, and we've had every change that ever existed in our tables. And I'll tell you, that is quite the process. It's, it's a mechanism you have to build all by yourself, and then you have to take good care of it. It's, a, it's an extra process. It's extra time. It's extra everything. So it's a lot of work maintaining your own history tables is really the bottom line there. So tem temporal tables, otherwise known as system version tables, not to be confused with temporary tables, they automatically track data changes on a table. So incredible. And there's a lot of good use cases for this. Um, auditing, obviously, is a big one. We can find out what values a specific entity had over its entire lifetime. Slowly changing dimensions, as I mentioned, these behave exactly like the type 2 changing behavior that we have uh, in SSIS in the data warehousing world. And then another big one here is kind of as a, a, a low budget backup solution to repair record level corruption. So, um, and I'm sure we've been here before. Have you ever forgotten a where clause or typed in the wrong where clause and bad things happen? Yeah, I've been there. Well, easily be able to recover from an accidentally deleted record by retrieving it from the history table, just running a quick insert to put it back into the main table. And then time travel. We can literally see our data at any point in time what it looked like. So these are awesome. They're all built in, and it just works. We, we can turn it on for a table, and we can, we'll can query our, our standard, normal, real-time table just like we would. And for history tables, these temporal tables, we have a new clause, the four system time clause, that'll allow us to pretty much put in any range we want. Um, as you can see there, you know, we can look for it all time, as of, between, and from, to, contained in, all that good stuff. So really simple feature, but oh man, it's gonna go a long, long, long ways, especially uh, as you know, if you've ever built your own history tables or audit tables, those triggers, oh, they're no fun to manage. Triggers are, uh, 
just uh, a big thorn in all of our sides. So temporal tables, number four, another great feature. Number three, polybase. Yeah, big data isn't going in, isn't going away. The the, the all the rage has kind of died down over the last year. You don't hear too much about it, at least from the SQL perspective. But IoT is ramping up, mobile is ramping up. We're capturing more data than we ever have before. And uh, and if anybody's ever worked in Hadoop, you know that it's it's a lot to learn. There's a ton of technologies to learn. So if you're a SQL professional trying to get into Hadoop, it's difficult. It's just it's overwhelming at first, just because of the size uh, of Hadoop and the number of tools with it. So Polybase is is a, a tool again built into SQL Server that allows us to hit our Hadoop clusters or unstructured data in Azure blob storage just like it was in SQL. And the, the best part about this is we can leverage all of our existing skill sets in SQL along with T-SQL to work with big data. And, and, and we can literally write select statements and join our Hadoop data to our SQL data and SQL will do optimizations in the background to determine where it should run the query. But uh, another fantastic addition here. And it's a great platform. It's got Flexible storage options currently supported by Cloudera, Hortonworks, Azure Insight, and of course, Azure Blob Storage. So yeah, we can access our non-relational data through SQL Server. Very powerful tool, really bridging the gap here between SQL Server and Hadoop. And again, you know, this is one of those things that's only going to get more relevant over time as IoT really starts hitting the market. And eventually, you know, we'll have, we'll have sensor-driven data everywhere in our shoes and our shirts and our you name it <laughs> we're going to have so much data we're not going to be able to not going to know what to do with it all and thankfully these these big data tools are very good at what they do but we won't have to learn how to do it we know data from sql from the structured side so why not be able to work with all that data leveraging our existing skill set so that's number three polybase number two is actually uh, i've got a bunch of number twos here all around security so we've got three pretty uh, incredible security features that again are just built in. One of the one of the themes that you see here with SQL Server 2016 is that it just works. We don't have to make any changes to our existing queries or our existing applications. We just turn the features on and they work under the hood. Starting here with always encrypted. So always encrypted is, is basically data encrypted all the time, all the time. And what that means is all of our data that is encrypted is completely protected from privileged users. You know what I'm talking about, those curious administrators, cloud providers, hackers, yeah. Your data is safe in SQL Server. Nobody can get at that data because only the client side, they're the ones with the keys, they're the ones that can encrypt and decrypt the data. And uh, another really cool thing about this is your all of your queries work, right? Comparisons, joins, group eyes, all that stuff will work on encrypted data. So it's end-to-end -end encryption with the keys stored on the client side. Our second security feature here is dynamic data masking, DDM. Has anybody ever written uh, a function or some SQL to, to mask your data? We don't have to do that anymore. It's all built into the system. So on the fly obfuscation of data. And you know we'll do this with things like credit card numbers and email addresses and social security numbers, all that stuff. And it's really easy to work with and it's all stored inside a SQL server. We've got predicates, functions that we can build and it supports partial masking, full masking, custom masking, we can do it all. So it allows us to just limit the exposure to that sensitive data. And by the way, the data is not physically changed either. So it's just coming out of the database like that. Um, great for regulatory compliance, adhering to privacy standards. Another great feature that is again, easy to work with. One more security feature here. This is one that we've been begging for for a very long time. Row level security. Built-in fine-grained access control. Without having to use views, how many people have tried to implement some sort of row-based security, row level filtering uh, in views? Yeah, it's not easy because eventually we have a ton of views out there and they're all difficult to manage. So this is again, just built right in. It's predicate-based access control. It can be very simple like, you know, where username equal current user, or it can be complex and, and you can really get deep and customize what and who sees this data. So this is great for obviously multi-tenant environments where you have a lot of different customer data 
we can easily wire up our queries now to contain users and they'll only see their slice of data. And this also works on inserts and updates as well. So another great one, and, and of course the logic being centralized at the database layer means we don't have to worry about this in the application layer. It's all centralized in the database and uh, another wonderful feature. So those are the three big security features coming and I think somebody will have a use for, for at least one of these, if not all three of them, because uh, they're great. They're great. All things that we had to do usually on the client side or with complex SQL in the past. All right, I'm gonna get to my number one favorite here. This is an incredible feature. So the stretch, a stretch database essentially allows us to take all of that cold data and push it off to the cloud. Now here's the thing, our databases are growing, right? They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And imagine those massive all TP tables where 70 to 80% of the data is cold, rarely accessed. That's a lot of baggage for a little value in a world where SQL resources are precious. But we need that data, so it just sits there bogging down our processes and productivity and resources. But now we can actually do something about it. So we stretch our cold data to the cloud. And what will happen is, and this is just another one of those features that we just turn it on. We turn it on and it works. And of course, there are some knobs so we can control uh, exactly what goes over and, and, and we can pause it to do troubleshooting and all that. But essentially what will happen is SQL will securely and transparently migrate cold or historical data without us needing to write our own ETL processes or you know, use near line or, or uh, offline storage for this kind of stuff. And the beauty of it is we still access that data like it's local. So we don't have to change any of our queries at all. Again, it just happens under the hood. And there are so many positives to this feature here. Number one, we, it's gonna dramatically increase the performance of all of our existing queries because now it's only working on that hot data. It's gonna dramatically reduce our maintenance time for local data, re-indexing, performance tuning, backups, restores, it all just hits the local data. All that cold data and, and historical data sits up in Azure. It's got built-in retries, and really the bottom line here is uh, cost-effective, it's scalable, it's gonna increase performance, and it's seamless. We just turn it on. No existing application or query changes required, and if you really are concerned about security, it supports always encrypted and row level security. So killer feature. So those are my top five. Um, let me move on here to certifications. So uh, we finally get a new MCSA. It's been a while. Uh, MCSA on SQL Server 2012 and 2014 was really three exams, 461, 462, and 463. Now, they've broken them out into three different MCSA certifications. So we've got the database development certification, that's 761762, purely around querying and designing complex queries and scripts and all this stuff. Another one is database administration, more around all your administration tasks and provisioning. And then we've got a BI track as well. So the really uh, neat thing about this is the MCSE changes that they've made. Here's how it works. All you need to do is acquire one of these. And by the way, you can, you can still acquire your SQL MCSA on 2012 or 2014. In fact, if you already have that, you can get an MCSE right now just by taking one of these electives. So these are electives over here. And, and by the way, they're, they're making this change across all of their certification uh, tracks. Windows works the same exact way. They've, they've really tightened up the MCSA side, and then they give us a big list of electives here for uh, the MCSC, and you only need to pass one. That's it. And how it works is on your transcript, you'll have your MCSA, and then you'll have your MCSE, and then underneath this, you'll have a year for every calendar year. So there was a little bit of confusion when these first came out that, oh, great, that means your MCSE is going to expire after a year. And that's not true. You get your MCS once, you have it forever. It's supposed to be a star. <laughs> you have it forever. So every year we get an opportunity then to do another elective. And you can only do one elective once. So once you pass one elective, it's done. You'll never be able to do it again. But the next year that rolls around, you'll be able to do another elective, and that'll go onto your transcript. So it'll look like, you know, you can prove to people that you're staying current. That's the whole point of this, this elective thing and why every year they add another calendar year to it and give you a shot at another left. It just shows people that you're staying current. That's all. But your MCSC will never expire. And by the way, these two are, uh, aren't yet available. Everything else is still in development. 
Uh, I imagine they'll come out of beta probably right around the first of the year. We'll be able to actually get in and, and, uh, and take all these. So check out that link at the bottom for more information. Um, that, that'll take you right to their MCSA page. Uh, we're pretty much outlines everything we just talked about. And yeah, we'll definitely be getting into these uh, probably uh, in the early part of next year. So stay tuned for more of those from CBT Nuggets. We'll cover all those certifications and then some. And by the way, Microsoft actually uh, is going to add more electives to this uh, as exams become available. So this is not a final list at all.